For seasoned commuters on the underground, there are certain aspects of certain stations that really stick in the memory, certain features that trigger that ha <laughs> I know, right? reaction. The vintage indicators at Earl's Court, the hassle of changing trains at Bank, and then there's the platforms at Clapham North and Clapham Common. These are what we call island platforms, effectively a single platform between two tracks. They can be kind of scary in rush hour, and many a commuter has spoken of the fear of being pushed onto the tracks. I'm not aware of any such accidents actually occurring here, but nevertheless overcrowding is a particular problem at these two stations. So why do they exist? Well, once upon a time these weren't unique. Island platforms also appeared at Stockwell, King William Street, Euston and Angel. All of these stations had one thing in common, they were built by the City and South London Railway. This was the first deep level tube line and it opened in 1890 from Stockwell to King William Street in the city. In 1900 it was extended south to Clapham Common and north to Moorgate, with King William Street being abandoned. In 1901 it extended further north to Angel. Railway companies liked island platforms because they were cheap. One platform between two lines took up less space than two lines and two platforms. You can see island platforms on a lot of main line stations. The Great Central Railway, who had no money to spare, absolutely adored them. But did they have to be this narrow? Well, I'm going to have to explain a little bit about the city and South London Railway. It was small. Small tunnels and small trains. A deep level railway under a city had never been attempted before. Although there had been a couple of railway tunnels under the Thames. The fear the builders of the city in South London had was that their line could damage buildings up above. There was also the question of paying for easement, i.e. permission to pass beneath buildings. Therefore, as far as possible, they constructed their lines beneath the actual roads and avoided buildings. At Clapham, the road was relatively narrow, and so too were the stations. This wasn't a problem at the time. Firstly, because the trains were wee little things, and the platforms were a little wider. And secondly, because of the way commuting worked back then. Railways allowed people to live further away from their work, but for a lot of people, train fares were a luxury. The majority of commuters up until the 1890s were middle class. Working class people usually lived within walking distance of their place of work. And I should point out that they had a much broader definition of walking distance back then. If they needed to travel further, they took the much cheaper trams, which were particularly plentiful in South London. A lot of railway companies resisted adding third class coaches to their trains on the grounds that so few people used them. They complained bitterly about legislation for cheap workmen's fares, arguing that this was a waste of time and money. In reality, this argument was a lot of horse feathers, because where cheap fares were offered, people invariably took advantage. The Great Eastern Railway had been legally forced to provide cheap fares in the 1870s, and the result was more passengers than they could handle, and a tidy profit into the bargain. But I digress. The point is that when Clapham Common and Clapham North were built, no one envisaged that they would ever get overcrowded. The city and South London were doing themselves down. They offered a highly affordable flat fare of tuppence, which made their line very attractive to South Londoners. The line was a great success. In fact, it soon proved inadequate for its original design. In 1913, the company received parliamentary approval to widen their tunnels to enable bigger trains to run. However, they didn't get to exercise these rights until after the First World War. In the early 1920s, the stations at Stockwell and Euston were reconstructed, but at Angel, Clapham Common and Clapham North they wound up with even less platform space. New stations constructed in the 20s would be built with separate platforms from the outset. By the 1990s, Angel had become quite fashionable, and so the island platform was dangerously inadequate. This station, too, was rebuilt, this time by the simple expedient of digging a second tunnel and filling in the original second track, creating one unusually wide platform and one new normal-sized one. So only the Clapham's were left. They have been a cause for concern. 
In 2015, a passenger fell under a train at Clapham South due to overcrowding, and the question continually arises. If it can happen at a more modern station like Clapham South, how much more risk is there for its northern neighbours? As of 2019, TfL had no plans to do anything about the structure of Common and North, but instead planned to approach the problem from a different direction. To increase train frequency, to restrict entry to the station, and to encourage travel at less busy times. As commuters return to the rails in the wake of the various lockdowns, or at least we hope we're in the wake of them, we'll see if these measures are up to the job. Good evening. I do hope you enjoyed this precarious tale from the tube. If so, it would be spiffing if you'd leave a like and you may wish to subscribe for more like this. And if you'd like more on this subject, there's a greater than zero chance that the website My London will publish a strikingly similar article in about five days' time. Thanks as always to my donors on Ko-fi and Patreon, you are the widened tunnels to my commuter train. And I'll see you all again very soon for another tale from the Tube.